welcome back to my podcast. And before I introduce my next guest, I would like to introduce our first sponsor, my first partner in crime, ProBallers.com. ProBallers, first of all, thanks for joining my experience. And for everybody out there, you, you as statistical geeks and basketball nerds already probably know this platform. It's a statistical platform that carries the top 75 leagues around the world. If you're on the road, you can conveniently access through your phone. It's optimized for the phones. Just go to ProBallers.com and have fun with it. Thanks a lot. Today's guest is Marco Pesic. He's the GM of the FC Bayern Munich basketball team. And we talked obviously a lot about communication. This is my bread and butter for everybody who knows me, knows that's what I'm going for. We talked about the dynamics within a team, the nuances between communicating with the sports director and the head coach and keeping every, everybody aligned with the program. We started off talking about his experience as a coach's son, growing up with the pressure of having a, a head coach as your father, which I also shared the experience with him. And we shared some commonalities ar uh, around that, obviously his being on a much higher level and all the nuances that come with that as well. At the end, we talked a little bit about balancing family and personal life, uh, as well as the job and the difficulties of that. Please enjoy Please subscribe, please comment, like it, share it. Most of the listeners that are listening or watching this are not subscribed. So I urge you to subscribe, press the subscribe button here on YouTube or subscribe to your audio platform, wherever you prefer to listen to and see you next time. Thanks a lot. Bye. Welcome, Welcome to my podcast world. Good morning, Dennis. Very happy uh, for your invitation. Long time no see. I'm glad you accepted yeah, yeah. I, I was waiting uh, to be honest uh, to you I, i'm following your podcast uh, i know i heard i heard always you know you always you always hear uh the typical basketball comments you know something hey, i haven't <laughs> been on the podcast i haven't been on there it's the locker room i love locker room talk locker room talk. yes That's good. yes yes so uh before we dive into it i did i did prepare a um uh, because you come from the era of of First of halves, you know, not quarters, yeah. halves. First half, yes. second half. So I have a first half prepared. That's, a, <laughs> that's the professional half, and the second half will be more personal and more based right. on on your uh, other side of the life. But before we go into it, I always have a little, I don't, I don't want to call it icebreaker, but an introductory uh, um, question. And there's something that we have in common. It's just on a different scale. Obviously, mm -hmm. um, we are both coaches' sons. Correct. So I'm I, I'm sure you've had millions of discussions about it, but I'm curious from from an aspect because Jason Tatum would just went also on a, on a podcast and talked about his relationship and how difficult it was, and I felt that it was difficult to play for my father in in different situations in youth, but also as a professional. And there's always this expectation there to do more than the others do, to not to disappoint your father, to be you know I. I when my father took me out, he all he took is just all it took is just take a look at me. You know, he didn't have to say anything. And then I go, he puts me back out because he knows he knows there's gonna be a reaction. And you play, or I played with tears in my eyes, trying to prove him wrong. And to this day, I feel like it's it's you know, it's good and bad because you kind of you're 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 putting not necessarily unsurmountable pressure on your kid, but it, the, the the relationship, the father-son relationship is not natural in that's in that sense. But without that, I wouldn't be where I'm at right now because of the sense of always trying to prove people wrong. So I'm wondering how did that influence your path and what the relationship was then and now? Well, if we would have this, this discussion uh, 20 years ago, it would obviously be totally different uh, because the perspective I had back then uh, was totally different than the perspective I have I have now, which is the result, obviously, we get older and, um, let's say, wiser or more experienced and, uh, you know, we go through life and uh, now you are a coach and you, you work for a uh, big uh, NBA franchise for a national team and I'm uh, in a totally different... Uh, uh, role right now that I was as a player. So analyzing uh, that uh, uh, relationship, I, I think today, looking from today's perspective, it was worse for my father than it was for me. Okay, because I believe that uh, him uh, um, him putting his son into 
into into a game or having him on the roster or uh, giving him this uh, the ball to decide the game or whatever it is is a huge huge responsibility and all eyes are basically on the coach less than a player uh, so i believe it was i think it was much more difficult for him than it was for me also looking from uh, from uh, this perspe- perspective today i was not smart enough you know i should have listened much more i believe you are always in the teenage uh, teenage uh, age when you're a teenager and you're growing and you're trying to you know uh, find your role in in the team the society and whatever it is you are always a, some kind of a rebel especially if your father is not only checking your grades from school at home but he's coaching obviously so um i should have for sure i should have uh, listened much more i would have been a much better player if i would have listened to him but you always kind of rebel against your father and uh, it is true that um this relationship uh, of a coach and son is something where a son is constantly in every practice in every game maybe in every interview trying to prove himself to you know so that at no point of time it's not like i know his father is playing him but you have to you're proving yourself to yourself no i'm worth it you know i'm you know i, I i'm the guy who has deserved this and you know i I've, I've i've met couple of uh, in my let's say last 20 years i've um i've met people who had the same situation and i always when they ask me you know how did you do it or how was it what was your experience i always said that i had in in these kind of teams that i played i had unbelievable teammates who who understood what my qualities are and who also understood the situation and i had unbelievable support from them and i believe if you want to summarize this if you don't have teammates who are in the locker room with you who understand what is your quality and that you are here not because of your father because of your qualities and then the support you get from from your teammates is something um, you can't you can't value it enough and i was lucky enough to have those kind of teammates now if i would not have these teammates I don't think I would have succeeded in anything I did in my career. This is this is obvious. So this is a sum, uh, let's say a sum up of um, my view of this of this situation. So it's there's always a fine line between breaking and proving. You know, like you you always right. feel like there's there's some point that you are going into your own head. You start thinking because there's so many dynamics in your head going through what's happening, and then the dynamic of a father, of your teammates, of coaches around it, of the people outside. And then you're also having to step outside of it and having a different view of it, of a of an all-encompassing view of that is just you're just part of a team and you just want to be a player on that team without the other dynamics around it. What is it? Where was the point where you said then you you start realizing this? Because there's at some point there comes there comes the maturity factor, the wisdom factor where you realize it and it's like, all right, this this is how it was, and that's that's how it was it should have been this way or another way is there is there a reflection point that you had well well first of all i always thought that i'm that i'm good enough to play in those teams that i played and then when i when i received the uh, the invitation to play for german national team this was the point where i said okay okay now this is not because of your father right because yeah. you you earned it okay this was the time where i understood okay and it was uh, pretty, you know 96 I believe, and I was 90, 20 years old, this is the invitation I received. And then I understood, okay, now I've proved myself that also other people, then maybe my father or the management of the club that I played for, uh, understand that I'm good enough to even play for the national team. Now, all this that I'm telling you right now is something that, or the experience that I have now, it took me a really, really long time to understand everything. And uh, now when I'm, uh, let's say, uh, general manager of an organization where I have to work with coaches, where we have a youth team, where we have young players, and we also have people who are somehow kids of people who are somehow connected to the club. Yep. And I see their struggle. You know, I, I, I'm really very sensitive 
sensitive to help in, or give my advice in that kind of situation. But at, at the end of the day, Ben, uh, what is what is key to us? The older you get, the more you cherish. I call I call this a seniority. You know, people who are old wise, mm. and the older you get, you need those people around you to ask for uh, for uh, uh, for advice. The younger you get, the more you push to, those people to the side because you think you know all best. So I think it is all some kind of uh, evolution also of a character and personality. That's... You know, you know, I had I had one situation just to tell you very briefly. I had one situation that I always tell. Uh, uh, People who are, let's say, who have a similar, who are in a similar situation. Uh, in I think ninety six, ninety seven, we played uh, back then. It was also Euroleague called, you know, and we played um, uh, we played Portes, okay. And uh, the night before the game, there was the last practice preparation and so on. And then in in Portes was this great player uh, Forest. I don't know if you remember him. Also lefty. Okay, uh -huh. so it used to in those kind of practices, the, um, the starting five was practicing defense and offense of uh, of our team, but the, the the second five or the other players were running the the uh, the place of the opponent team. So suddenly Henning Hanish was playing against me. Okay, so uh, and. I drove, uh, by the way, I still, I believe I still hold the record in Alba Berlin for a player who got thrown mo thrown out of the practice the most. <laughs> <laughs> I think, I think nobody, uh, nobody will break this record ever. So, you know, I was playing the play, I drove and uh, Henning really hit me, hit me hard. Okay. And I told him, you know, Henning, you know, don't hit by hitting me. So he didn't react. So the next play I drive, he hits me even harder. Okay. So I go crazy and I hit him back. I get thrown out of practice. Okay, uh, I'm mad. I'm crying. You know what the fuck? I get, oh, sorry for my language, but why again me? Why is he aiming at me? Why did he throw me? I didn't see that he hit me. And then the assistant coach came to me and said, "Marco, listen, Henning, Henning was told to play aggressive on you because he needs to play aggressive tomorrow against Forest." And you know, I did not, I didn't understand this. Today, I would understand this, yeah. but these are kind, some kind of situations that probably you have to go through. But that's that's the beautiful circle of of a basketball life because you see all these dynamics that are, you know, different influences. Like assistant coach has 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 yeah. gives you one right. information. The head coach, the, the 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 was Henning captain at that time? No, Henning Riddle was always captain when I played. Okay. Well, and and it's but it's he was just, obvious, obviously a legend, you know. Yeah, he was a figure. Was, he was he was he yeah, was a, sure. he was a big big figure, and in in that sense, you have all this all these experiences encompassing now your your role right now, and then that's the perfect transition to the to the next uh, part of our conversation. We go into the first half with communication, which is my 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 bread and butter. <laughs> so we the the triangle between the the GM, the sports director, and the head coach. And the team being in the middle, you know, so I have my experiences also from different clubs and I know, and I, I have several things that I want to talk about, but I know that there's always pressure from the coach on the team, on the players, pushing them, not literally, but pushing them away metaphorically, right? Because he's putting always pressure on the team, on one player, on, on, on another player, on certain situations, trying to get a good reaction. And the player is going to look talk to the assistant coaches, they're going to talk to the manager, they're going to talk to the sports director, they're going to use, they're going to try to look for conversations, but also the conversations come sometimes from the management to push them back towards the coach. So the players are always in the middle. They have to kind of have to find to find themselves and organize themselves by being pushed back and forth. I'm wondering, first of all, what's, what's the communication pattern when those situations happen, for example, between you, the sports director, and the head coach. Do you guys talk about those things before it happened, or you is it just from experience, from from gut feeling that you see you have to step in and you have to uh, mention certain things to the team or to certain players? Well, you know, I was I was lucky enough in my my basketball career to to basically run through all possible situations. You know, from being maybe the best player in the team to being. Uh, you know, uh, one of the best players, then being a role player, then being a player who doesn't play much, and being a player who was at the end of the bench, uh, not playing at all. 
So I've been, I've seen everything, all of these situations, especially the last ones that I explained are very, very tough on a, on a player. So I believe that uh, it helps me, first of all, understand, uh, uh, understand the, um, uh, the perspective of each kind of situations that the player can get. So this is something that I, that I have. Now we have a coach who is, uh, who is obviously a legendary coach, but he was also an unbe unbelievably good player. So he, there you have another guy who also perfectly understands how players feel in certain situations. Now, for me, it's always tough because, like you said, sometimes I react in instinct instinctively, but I, I try to force myself before I say something or do something to really be in, in, in sync and in communication with my sports director and coach. Because obviously, uh, you know, I'm not at the, I can't be in every practice. Uh, them two are in every practice. Also, sports director is not in every meeting. But basically, you, know, you never know, you know what the dynamic is uh, when you're missing three days of practice. So um, I believe the key, the, the key here is before you go into the season that you constantly talk, obviously, you set goals. And when you set the goals and you agree on the goals, you have to have the trust in your coach and in your sports director that they will follow this path. Otherwise, you will have to get up every morning at 8 o'clock and then talk to the coach every day what you're going to do in practice or not, and the same with the sports director. And I believe um, I believe that... Um, with Daniela, I have a, a partner who is uh, excellent in those kind of uh, things. Uh, I believe we have a coach now who also uh, cherishes to exchange opinions. Uh, he doesn't take every opinion, I believe, but it's good that we exchange opinions. Also, Andrea was excellent in those kind of things, you know, to let's make a plan and let's uh, stick to it, which means you might lose a couple of games and so on. Now, you can't control everything, but I believe this communication on a on a daily basis, I would say, uh, between coach, between the management and the coaching staff also, I think this is a key uh, to, uh, you know, to understand, first of all, what's going on, what does the management think, what does the coaching staff think, but also to give a coach some kind of, uh, not motivation, but uh, support in the sense that um, he has a carte blanche always, I say a carte blanche to interact and make decisions uh, with, with the team the way he feels it. Obviously, in accordance to to the to the timetable and the plan that we agreed on before the season. But there is one very important thing when you talk uh, when you talk about communication is not to not not only to think that there is a coaching staff, there is a, a team, there is a, um, there is management, uh, there is also a medical department. You know, and in my experience as a, as a player, when you had a problem with a coach or a teammate, or you had a problem uh, with your girlfriend or wife or whatever, where you always meet is in the physiotherapist room. You know, you always you always meet there. You always, you're, you're at the doctor, especially on road trips. You know, you go to treatment, massage, and this is where the players meet. So what is also very important is to put big emphasis in quality of the people, not only in the sense that, um, that, um, are they good physiotherapists or are they good doctors? Because this is, let's say, a given. But they have to be quality people in the sense to, you know, not run immediately to coach or management, but to be able to solve those, let's say, small issues, um, interpersonal issues between players, maybe, to be able to solve them by themselves. And this is something that people always forget how important those people are, not only by, by uh, uh, solving an injury, uh, or giving a diagnosis for an injury, but they they have to be really high quality human people to to work every day with with the players. You know, totally agree. That's that's the um, emotional IQ that's necessary for that for that position, especially. And I I think that's the they don't only massage bodies; they massage the head in the sense as well, Agreed. because yeah. they have to absorb so much information and they have to have certain life experience, but also professional experience to to be able to distinguish what filter they have to use to absorb information, what's imp important for them to know, what's important for the coach not to know at all because that can distort his decision-making. So all, all those things that some people outside, they don't, they don't really have a feel for that situation when, when they say, oh, this is our, these are physios, they just do one job. They have a, a, a big, big mass. That's the old 
now it's sports psychology it has a different different uh, um, branch but the the physios ha have a sense of sports psychology in a completely interpersonal basis like you say no no i agree but because th this is a totally different relationship you know uh, a coach uh, man uh, let, let's say management and the physiotherapist or a team manager a guy you know who helps with stuff who uh, you know these people are so so important because in in if if you in comparison to the time where I played, you know, you had maximum one uh, assistant coach, uh, you had the f yeah. one physiotherapist, you had the doctor who never traveled with the team. Now, you know, when you travel to Euroleague games, you travel with 30, 32 people. There are so many people around uh, around the players, and this is uh, it is really it is really really important to not not control but to make sure that people who are around the team are quality people and they are for the right reason yeah. and um, i think for for my organization i must say we have extraordinary people around the team and that's you know the all encompassing roles around the the players itself besides the physios but the the positions that i mentioned the sports director the management the coach because the pushing away part and is very important in the sense of protecting the coach's job as well. That's why the, the position of the ma management is so important to push the players back towards the coach in the sense of supporting them, making the players feel like they, they are heard because, you know, you also have to make, give them a feeling of that you care for them and for their career and for their well-being. But at the same time, you also absolutely have to support the head coach in the back wow. of, of the of, because otherwise the, the players feel that there's a loophole you know and then the coach is losing the oh. authority in a sense and that's, that's very subtle but very important no listen uh i mean i heard a lot of episodes that that you had with you know legend legendary coaches you know uh talking about this topic and uh, uh and how how they emphasize the importance of the people working with them their coaching stuff now the worst thing you can do is, uh, you know, and I don't say I've, I've done, uh, I did not do these mistakes in my career. You know, if you don't, if you're not able to accept mistakes and uh, and say, listen, I made a mistake here and there, then you're not credible. But the worst thing you can do is like open the door to a player to understand, ah, here, you know, outside of our locker room between coach, management, sports director, something is wrong, which gives a player at the same time alibi, you know, so... You know, mm -hmm. I as a former player, it may be stupid to say, but you have to take those alibis away from players. And uh, the best way to do it is to have a really, really close, uh, a close communication. I don't say relationship also, but very close and transparent communication, especially between sports director and, and the coach. And obviously uh, with, 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 with the management, because if you're not satisfied with something the coach does, you know, you have to be able to tell them. If the coach is not satisfied with something the management did, too many media appointments, uh, too many sponsorship appointments, uh, we are not flying charter, why are we not flying charter, this and this. If you're able to communicate this in this group of, uh, of the people that I just said, the players, they, they immediately sense tension. And this is something that we, we need to avoid in the sense, you know, to to not, not give a, maybe this is too harsh, but not to give a player an alibi for not practicing hard enough, not being on time, yeah. not being disciplined, you know. And uh, this is a very tough, you know, it's a, it's not a, it's not, I always, when I talk to people who are not from sports, you know, this, this in, in, a, in a sports environment, in a basketball club like, like ours, where you travel a lot and you have many games, you know, in one week, you lose three games, everything is upside down, you know? So things can change really fast and in, in different industries. And this is why it's very important, uh, this communication, like you said, from the beginning with management, sports director and, uh, and coach. So let's let's continue on with the communication pattern in terms of, because those, those situations, like you said, arise most of the time out of um, conflict, right? Conflict or losses or some sort of, um taking a different path that you planned for okay you you feel like you're you're deviating from from what you really aim for and that's when frustration comes out that's when conversations have to have to be had so from your experience if you think if you can reflect or also maybe project in terms of hardest conversation you've had without mentioning names or without having some sort of um uh, specifics just just to keep that as as uh, you know 
private as possible. But the hardest conversation that you can have, maybe on a general uh, uh, basis, in the club that the conflict resolving with the player on a private on a private conversation uh, with the coach to have a conversation that is that is that can they can be also elevated emotionally because it's sports basketball is an emotional sport and we all have ambition and we all have drive that we want to also express our our frustration in a certain sense so there's some sort of that you have to control emotions but in in, in a sense also you're working with emotional beings and it can get out of hand what's what's the hardest conversation you can imagine having or have had in the past well well you know I, i'm uh... If this is a good or, or bad trait, you know, it's well, sometimes it's good, sometimes it's bad. I'm I'm uh, I'm a firm believer that uh, conflicts solve problems. So you know, there are people who run away from conflicts uh, and try to fi find a, a different way to solve uh, uh, so solve issues or so solve situations or even uh, even uh, problems. I'm rather somebody who runs into the conflict because everything else is to me. I lose time, you mm -hmm. know. So sometimes, I, some, this is me you now. Daniele, for instance, with us is totally different. Okay, he he's the opposite uh, of me regarding conflict. Pablo is maybe something in between. So what I want to say is, when, when, first of all, uh, regarding solving challenges or problems, you know, not everybody is supposed to talk to everybody. Okay, because sometimes there is a player that. I can talk better too, and then the coach says, Marco, why don't you talk to him? And then there are some players that regarding really their character, I should stay away. And then Daniela talks or Pablo talks. So this is very important to understand that you cannot solve all the problems by yourself. You need mm -hmm. people around, you need a team. This is the first thing. But the biggest uh, regarding me and the biggest conflicts I had in my time with Bayern Munich, for instance, were always involved about uh, around one topic, and this is putting yourself above the club. And this is this is where I, for myself, don't don't make any any compromise. If if I see that a coach or somebody from the management, even back office, but especially the players, put their interests above interests of the team of the club, this is where I immediately uh, immediately react. Now you have to understand when you walk into the locker room, we have now 16, 18 players. They are different age. They, are, they come from different countries. They're different cultures. They are. They have different individual goals, obviously. You know, a young player plays for playing time and a player in his mid-20s, he plays for a bigger contract and the older players maybe is trying to have a great end of his career. There are always different interests, which I understand that you have to cherish and you have to mold them into a team goal. But if there is somebody who tries to be above the group above the team above the club this is where i get most of the conflicts uh, really and this is where i'm not uh, not ready to compromise otherwise i'm ready to do everything because i define my job as being a problem solver rather than problem maker in order for for the group to function and the club to function but in the moment where i feel that now this is always subjective that somebody thinks that he's above the group or the organization this is where i get the most of the conflicts and this is where i don't compromise what's what's one sign for you that somebody puts himself above the club yeah if he doesn't for instance if he doesn't respect the group dynamics if he's not on time if he's um, if for instance if he's uh, not in time if he's not if showing disrespect towards uh, towards the coach uh, publicly towards uh, the media publicly because I believe you know there is no problem everybody should have, have his opinion but if you don't voice your opinion or the problem internally and but you go publicly yeah. I mean there is there is no reason for this um, but you know I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm also not a guy who is uh, you know who says everybody should be it should be like an army or like a police this is not the issue but you know, you have to, uh, you know, we are not in tennis or boxing or even Formula One, but all, even them right now have huge teams around them. You know, yep. when you uh, look at uh, Djokovic, uh, he, he travels with seven, eight uh, people with him. This is also a team. So uh, I believe that um, respecting respecting your teammates, respecting uh, the rules of the club, um, this is something that uh, even in, in this time, Times today, in which we live, 
Uh, I'm not a guy who goes back then. When I played, it was everything better. I'm not uh, this kind of a person because time involves and you should involve at the time. But I believe that uh, respecting your teammate, coach, people next next to you is something. If you don't do it, these are first signs of of a person being uh, on a different path. Yeah. I, I don't say disrespecting the organization, maybe, but on a different path. And uh, now the first thing is you have to correct it. And this is where you mostly get in conflict. Yeah. yeah, you see it. Most of the whole team is our basketball players and you have one tennis player that's a little bit playing for, for himself by himself. It's That's when you have to catch catch it before it gets out of hand, before it goes outside yeah. of the circle. And that's the, the 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 dynamic you talk about of the internal communication and But external. you know, you know uh, Benaz, I just want to make one thing, thing clear. A very smart guy, Matthias Sammer. You know, he's, um, you know, uh, also legendary German player. He worked for Bayern Munich as a... Uh, as, uh, let's say as a manager of the sports department uh, one, once he told me when we were discussing a little bit about structure of of the team and he told me usually usually in the team there are three different groups okay there are um, there are the people who are leaders okay mostly captains or all the players then there are players who are you know individualists they are mostly one of one or two of them and there are there are team players who don't carry the water for others but who are the roles that are helping the team function okay and without individualists without two or three players who have a certain quality you can't win okay and but also with those players who let's say carry the water for others you can't win now if you are able Because, you know, without some, somebody who does something special on the court or who is looking more for his shot than, than other things, you can't win. The question is, can you all mold to work for each other? And, and I, I have no problem with people who are individualists, you know, who go on the court and then they take the ball and in 15 minutes they score 20 points or score five, four points but take 15 shots. You know, I, this is not a problem. You need those kind of players. But the question is, you know, how far do they go? And this is something that you tend to control. You know? But that's that's one that's another aspect of of building a team. Because I just talked to 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 Danny Mills, and we talked about how influences he he takes from other sports, from from uh, AFL, you know, Australian Rules Football, or or rugby, or other teams. But the the how you project yourself to the outside and how you build all this culture from the inside to make it naturally the the rules you know have you have you um have you, have you heard of the all blacks the 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 yeah, sure so the, sure. the 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 culture that they built throughout the years the winning culture that was that was basically nothing at, at uh, up until that point it was they were drunks they were just unorganized but then they went all the way to everybody's sweeping the floor you know before after games or before 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 practices after practices Where do you start with building the culture? Because in my sense, there is culture is something that happens when management is also not around. This culture has to be an evolving okay. natural natural um, uh, organism that that flows up uh, from from the bottom up to the top. Uh, Coach Alex Ferguson, as I also mentioned it in Danny's podcast, Coach Alex Ferguson, in almost 30 years of his career at Manchester, he had to only step in. Twi I think twice or once or twice into the locker room to resolve conflict because the culture took care of it. The locker room leaders took care of the culture before uh, of the of the conflict before he had to step in. So there is a point where you you also mold the team in a certain way so you can create this culture. Where do you start and what you do you specifically look for people to uh, that you have hired to build that culture? Well, first of all, uh, Pep Guardiola said in one of his interviews a couple of years ago, they asked him, what do you miss from, do you miss being a player? Okay. And he said, I don't miss a single thing from being a player. What I miss is the locker room. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, and this is true. You know, I, sometimes when you play a big game and so on and so on, you would, and I would say, oh, damn, I should, I should, I, this game I would like to play. But what you really miss is the locker room because all the social activities that you do you do it in the locker room so the lock this is why many coaches many clubs and many organizations put emphasis on who gets into locker room or not because so many things happen in the locker room and in best case scenario the locker room solves all the problems for itself 
right? You don't need the coach, you don't need the sports director, you don't need Marco, you don't need Benas. If you have a very good locker room with players who take responsibility, with players who understand who are those who take responsibility or who are leaders, basically, they, you know, they, the locker room is able to to solve all the all the problems inside of the team. You know, I had a great, great, great generation. I was part of the national team of Germany for six, seven years. I mean, Hendrik Detman was a coach, and he understood he understood that he has to leave us alone because we were able to solve all our problems internally. Now, this is not always the case. Because sometimes, especially in club basketball, when the teams and players change a lot uh, in comparison, for instance, for soccer, in, in, in soccer or national teams, it is a bigger challenge. Now, the mistake, no, we are really very young, not very young, but we are still a young organization. You know, we started in 2011 being professional, now it's 2023, so it's 12, uh, 23, 24, so it's 12, 13 years. And the biggest mistake that you could make is you read the uh, Old Blacks book. And then you take this and you then you copy it. It doesn't work, you know. It doesn't work in this environment. Uh, or I'm a because of Henry Crodel and then the late uh, the late um, the Mola Kulaja. And uh, now I had uh, Dion Thompson with us. I'm a big fan of the UNC culture, University of North Carolina. Not the way they play, but what I really like is that every summer. All these former players, alumni, they meet and they practice together, work together with new players, with uh, with the players they you know they invite that the team invites maybe freshmen, maybe high school players. I don't know what the rules are. Uh, then I'm a huge fan of Jogi Riscaunas, the way they build up their organization in small market. Then I'm a huge fan of Real Madrid, the way in the soccer club they found their role, the way they give themselves. So there are many many examples around you in, in, in the environment that you're moving in where you can learn from, okay? But you can't copy it. So what we are trying to do is still, I'm not saying we have the golden key for this uh, lock. We are still looking for the, for, the, for, 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 for the right culture, but you can't copy it. You can learn from many other examples. But it, but look, Benas. At the end of the day, whatever I would write, let's say as a general manager in the world, this is our culture. It doesn't help you. It has to live from uh, in within the within you, within you, and not only from players, especially from back office people, as you know, for people who work every day for the club, the example they give and the enthusiasm they they show, the responsibility and the emotions that they show uh, towards the club. Then again, physiotherapists, the doctors, the people who are every day in the gym, they define also the culture of the club because when the player sees that somebody is taking care of your kids um, uh, for kindergarten or whatever, you know, maybe a stupid example, and the players who leave your club, who are with you and leave your club, they are they're the biggest ambassadors of your, of your brand. So you have to treat the players in the right way. Because they spread the spread the word mouth to mouth, mouth, mouth the word, and we are still in search of this culture. I cannot tell you exactly. I have to be honest. This is the culture of Bayern Munich. Okay, we are still forming this, but I don't believe it. It is the right thing to copy something because it doesn't work in your environment. Correct. It's it's a uh, it's it has to be an intrinsic emotion that is naturally right. a natural commitment to the cause whatever the cause is whether it's a team it's a family or whatever it's 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 a natural commitment to the co to the bigger cause that's above you and you do it because you believe in it and, and uh, there, there's an, another thing sorry to interrupt you there's another thing that for instance uh, when, when when you look at olympiacos in the last couple of years and then you look uh, to real madrid in the last couple of years uh the continuity of personal that you have is a big help also to build a culture. Because yeah. if you, and, and this is the biggest uh, challenge for us as an organization to have the continuity in the squad because continuity also costs money. It's not, it's not cheap. Now, we have now, somehow we found a way to keep players here. Lucic is, I believe, seven or eight here. And there's Obst and all these people are now here for a longer time. And... It's very, you know, the challenge that we have in European basketball is the continuity, continuity of, 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 of 
players and coaches in, uh, you know, in one club. This is why Olympiacos and Real Madrid are so good at this point of time. Everybody now is searching uh, for, for the rhythm, for the right starting five, for uh, togetherness. And they are just, if they are not struck by injuries like Olympiacos is now, they just glide through the process, you know. And this is something that we have to work on to, to secure this continuity with players. And then the culture also becomes more, let's say, easier to build yes. something, you know. Stable, more, more stable, more, more. Yeah. Yet it's the, the word I, that came to mind is identity because you, you see, you, you are building the identity. And as you know, you know better than me in the locker room or if even, you know, just you, you exchange or you put a new person, new player in, new staff member, it change, it, it, it organize, the organism, organism changes again. It's, it's a constant moving. Totally. I totally agree. So if you have a group of people who are in the club a longer time, like for instance, I'm not praising Real Madrid too much, but if you come to a locker room with you, uh, Fernandez, uh, you know, th those people who are, you know exactly what the rules are. And you listen to those people and you don't have to, you know, uh, I, you know, think of what should I do now? They tell you. And this is something that we are working on. You know? So we continue the path of culture building. That, that's why the head coach is also an integral part of it. While, when, when you are implementing, you're trying to implement an identity or implement a culture, besides the tactical part, the person also matters that's going to run the group, you know? And like you said, the times are changing and you have to have, sometimes you also, you... I don't know. I, I'm 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 hypothesizing, hypothesizing here. If you hire a coach because of the group that you have in in place in locker room to run that group, or if it's something that you see that the coach is is no matter no matter what the group is, this is going to be the coach, and the group is going to have to adjust to the coach. What qualities do you look for? What what qualities matter to you the most when you look at a head coach according to the group that you have already under contract? Well, now coming. Like you mentioned previously, from a, from a coach's family, you know, and uh, automatically, you know, and having the privilege to meet uh, to meet all b most big European coaches in my life, I obviously have huge respect uh, for for the job of the coach and what it takes to become a coach. And now the times have changed. Uh, uh, maybe 10, 15 years ago, a coach, coach would have more chance to work for a club, to build something of his, uh, implement his culture, implement his idea. Now, in today's fast and, and involving environment of sports, not only in basketball, but in other sports, the coach has to win. Okay, the higher the level you go, the, the more emphasis is on the coach to win. So... So this is this is why it's important how does management and how, how does management approach the coach and with what kind of a goal. So if you approach a goal, listen, this is a team, you choose three, four players, you choose an assistant coach, and now you go out and win. Okay? This is this is one one of the options. And I don't believe in this option. You know, I don't believe uh, uh, you know I I, I be, you know I don't believe uh, come and win because I because this does not only depend you can have the best possible coach the best team but it still does not only depend on you because you might get hit by the injuries the referees might make a call the player you know might get whatever injured or does make the last shot so so I, I'm rather the guy who believes in the process and in uh, and the process and and the process the process I mean is you know let, let's make a plan over a season, over two seasons, let's choose the players for this and let's stick to the plan. Even if you lose a couple of games, you have my trust and the trust of the club that if you stick to the plan that we agreed upon, it will be fine. You, I have patience. Okay, don't worry if this happens. If you play a young kid three or four games in a row and you lose the game, Hey, the blame is on us. Don't, don't worry about this. I believe in this. And for this, you need to have the right partner who understands this. And also, also there, but not judging any people, there are coaches who come for fame to win, to win immediately to go somewhere else. And then there are coaches who are ready to accept this idea and say, I understand this project. I buy into what you say. Can I rely on you? Yes. Okay, let's go. So... This is what I this is what I personally look into. Somebody who is ready to sit down, make a plan, and then 
not leave the plan with the first obstacle that comes or the challenge that comes in your way. And I believe with Andrea was, you know, Andrea is a total, Andrea Trinkieri, obviously, yeah. is a yep. totally different uh, person than Pablo is now. They are totally different. But with Andrea, it, it worked pretty good, uh, generally. And he was faced with a lot of adversities, uh, COVID, uh, injuries, uh, indecisive, in worst possible moments of, uh, of a season. But I could work very good with him, you know, in that, in that kind of sense. Uh, and I think Pablo is, of, although they are different personalities, uh, also this kind of a coach. Okay, let's make an agreement before the season what we, what we want to do, and let's stick to the plan. And this is something that I really cherish and like, uh, like with the coach. So, so <laughs> in, in believing and watching the process, that's the thing that's, that's yeah. you know, c- compared to the NBA, it's lacking in Europe because of the, you know, the contracts, the situation of instability. Right. It's, it's, mu- it's a much different dynamic and people who are in this business, they understand. What's the sign for you that the process is not working when you see that this, the, there's, there's, there's some hiccups and uh, they are, whether they're correctable or not, it's, it's uh, something to put in question. Well, oh, different because, you know, if somebody is, uh, because I had this example uh, in our organization, somebody agrees, okay, I'll do it, uh, we'll do everything, and uh, but I need those three people with me in order to, and you agree on it, and at one point of time, you see, uh, okay, he is, we agreed on the plan, but he brought his people in order to make sure that, that he controls everything, uh, you know, what is the management doing, blah, blah, blah then we have a problem because again there is nobody bigger than the club and the organization you work for so there are certain situations not when you lose or win the game uh, these things can happen but if you have a plan how to develop a young player or you bring a young or you bring a uh, somebody who maybe had a bad bad season last year but you bring him in trusting in his uh, in his individual quality that he will, by playing time and by giving him support and motivation, he will develop to something uh, like, for instance, Wade Baldwin did with us in that season when he came from Lipiakos, where he struggled a lot and they came to us and flourished immediately. Uh, you can't, after two, three games, give up on this player. Exactly. Yep. You know, and if, if a coach gives up on this player, although we agreed on that we have to trust him, then it's a problem. Because then he asks for changing the player, and then he uh, then th- this means we have to spend money that we don't have, and so on. So this is why it is important to have a coach who understands the plan he agrees upon with, and has trust in you that you don't criticize him after he loses two games. You know, it's very difficult in today's environment, but I really believe in this. Yeah, that's again, that's the organization giving the coach comfortable trust that they that they feel secure in 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 that role of being the the. The winner, but also the developer and the builder of the of the of the culture, and that's sure. the thing that you do observe the practices, and that's those things you like you said. Whenever you are in practice, you observe, you see certain things in terms of uh, the process being do- done the right way or the way you imagine. Because Messina also said there's there's no right or wrong. There's different, you know. There's different truths. So agree. so so there's it could be this could be right and this could be right. And it's it's on, on 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 every year, every team, every every situation is different, and you have to recognize those things. No, no, I, I totally agree with this. I mean, there's, I'm not saying what I'm saying is right and what you're saying is wrong, but uh, I totally agree on this. So. You know, I'm not uh, never in my never in my career I've interrupted or told the coach how to practice uh, his team. Like I never uh, say to my ticketing guy how to talk how to sell tickets. Yeah. Yeah. You know, so why would you hire those people if you know better than them? Uh, uh, I don't interfere in those kind of things. I do observe practices, and what I really there are two reasons, uh, which one is totally stupid, totally stupid, which is I can't leave a practice without making sure nobody got injured. Mm. Because my biggest fear, my biggest fear that I have is that I'm not, in, uh, that I find out somebody got injured. I mean, this is something totally stupid, but this is uh, very important to me. So I always, when I'm in practice, I try to stay until the end to make sure nobody gets hurt. Uh, but on the other side, what I really uh, observed during practices is how do they get along between each other? What is mm-hmm. the communication between not only coach and player, but players among each other? Mm-hmm. And this is when with a little experience, you can sense if there is a tension or not, or should you talk to a coach, listen, I 
I saw Bolmaro and Francisco not get along. Is it something that we have to take care of? Or is it something that you, you want to happen because you provoke the situation? And this is, this is how I, what, what I do during practices, which is very interesting, obviously. But I never do interfere in the do this drill or that drill. I'm not stupid because I'm not a coach. Yeah, that's that's the micro versus micromanagement part that that you you yeah. see from the outside that what what's your role and what you can influence and what you should or should not address. Like you said earlier, you know, some things you you should not address. Some things are being taken care of itself, and those are the most interesting dynamics for me on a team. What locker room, you know, some situations naturally happen, and you observe it from the outside. You see this this is supposed to happen this way this is good you know sometimes we had our best successes with the national team when we had conflict within with, within the locker room and that stays internally what happened or who who did what but we did have it and then the group either finds it, it's each other or you disintegrate completely well, but most of the time if you have the characters in place they want they all doing for the same goal you, you're going to find each other and you're going to elevate it Totally agree with you. Totally agree with you. Like I said, sometimes conflicts are provoked by coaches. Like in my case, when I got thrown out of the practice, <laughs> sometimes sometimes they happen because something has built up over time. You know, in, in, in a relationship between the big guy because he doesn't set a screen and then he thinks he should uh, get the ball and then the point guard tells him, you want the ball, go to the offensive rebound. There are enough balls. <laughs> you know, you, know you, you, you never know. But then you talk to the coach, say, did you see there is a tension between them players? And then he tells you, Marco, listen, I want this tension. Or, mm -hmm. no, I didn't see it. Let me check. And this is, this is what I see as my, let's say, job. Sometimes coaches ask, sometimes they don't. But this, this, is what, this is why I go to the practices. And and when you when you mention youth integration and development, where where for you is the point? Because there's a there's a difference between practice, you know, and theory. And some players, it's good for them to practice with the professionals just to experience it this first sense. And then you have to make a decision: either give them playing time or loan them out. When is the process? When when is the 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 point for a youth player to that you realize? Okay, he's done with practicing and watching, observing. He's got enough of that chewing in his mouth now we have he has to swallow it and go up or get get, get either get the playing time or get loaned out when is the decision for you that's that has to be made or is there you know first of all you need to have a coach who who believes uh, listen I, 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 I'm, I'm a firm believer that having two young let's say two young players in a, in a team is a total necessity because those young players, if they are good, obviously they have to have quality. And if they're hungry, they will disturb the players who are, uh, you know, who are uh, yeah. settled. Yeah. If you understand what I mean, they will pressure the ball in practice. When you say, you know, uh, when I get uh, when I get got older in the national team and I was playing against Mita Demirel and we were practicing, I would tell him, Mita, listen, I leave you alone. You leave me alone. And they would do, then you would like to practice basically, you know. But then there are, when there are young players and the coach tells him, okay, you got the point guard, and then he gets into him and then he provokes him, then he hits him, the old player, you know, it, he provokes some kind of reaction. This is, but not only because of, out of this reason, I believe there should be young players, okay? Mm -hmm. The problem, the, pro, the problem in today's basketball is that coaches don't have time because they need to win. Mm -hmm. And, and this is, again, why it is important to have a plan with the coach before the season starts. And the plan has always to be, and this is why Pablo, why Pablo is great, because he has done it on the highest stage with the biggest club, one of the biggest clubs in Europe, is you need to coach who trusts and has, has the motivation, but also has, uh, has no fear playing young players. Okay, so this is very important. Now, when is the player when is the player ready to to stop practicing? Never, stop learning? Never. When is he ready to get loaned on? It depends on a certain situation. But I, for myself, believe that there is no bigger school than for a German player making making it through the youth program of Bayern Munich and making it to the first team of Bayern Munich and have, and having playing time uh, with Bayern Munich and then mm -hmm. moving on. Not all players are ready to do this. You know, in Germany, we have a rule that you can have maximum six foreigners in a, in a, in a Bundesliga team that opens up at least six positions for, 
for German players, times 18, you can count up. There are not so many pl uh, players in Germany that maybe have the quality uh, to have uh, huge roles. In uh... So the temptation is big to go to a club, e uh, even if you're not ready, because they need a German player. They say, you know, come here, we will give you a chance. And this is also, uh, always uh, it's a challenge for young players, obviously. But uh, right now we have a great generation of young players here in Munich, and Pablo came at the right uh, point of time, and I think they are seeing uh, a light at, at the end of the tunnel in the sense that if they perform and uh, their discipline and their practice and they do individuals, they're going to play. So this is uh, why I'm very happy that also that Pablo is here. Yeah, this, that's, a, that's a great topic for, for another discussion about the integration yeah. of youth teams, and especially in Germany, which now yeah. be bears, bears, bears fruit now. Um, Marco, before we go into the second half, yeah. uh, as I told you before, we have our first sponsor, and it's a yeah. first, first, uh, first podcast with a with a big guest and a big sponsor that I wanted to also integrate here together with you. And I'm going to share my screen because it's ProBallers.com that they have statistics from from Europe, from all different leagues, and uh, I wanted to look back at the game. I'm going to share my screen now, if you can see it. Uh, hopefully, yes. ho hopefully it's visible. It. Okay, and uh, if we go back now, I, I had I'm on Euroleague here, and we go back to the game against Panathinaikos yeah. uh, to 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 press on the box score, and uh, obviously the free content. Uh, <laughs> I have ad blockers on. Um, Good. So, if we go and analyze a box score here, that your game at Panathinaikos, there's certain things you look for at halftime. And there are certain things to look yes. for at, at the at the end of the game. And now this is the end of game box score. What's the first thing that jumps into your mind when you look at the game? And if every game is different. I'm sure that you have, you look at uh, you look at different things for different games. But specifically okay. for this game, what did you look for uh, at this box score? Well, at, uh, you mean at half at, at half time or at the end of the game? At the end of the game. Well, for, first of all, the, the 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 couple of things that I look immediately uh, uh, at. When I look at the uh, stat sheet at the end of the game, is uh, uh, turnovers. I look mm -hmm. at turnovers. I look at assists. Mm -hmm. I look at offensive rebounding, and I look at free throws. Because you, those at free throws. Mm -hmm. And you you yeah. won almost every category that you mentioned. Correct. Except as assists. Uh, and free throws. And free throws, okay. yeah, free throws. Less, yeah. less free throws, but you had hundred percent. Like, you, you consider a win yeah. if you sh if you shoot more no. free throws or make a higher percentage. No, no, no. What I want to say is why I look at these columns is because they define some kind of the how aggressive we were. Mm -hmm. You know, uh, so I, I, generally, I'm telling you generally, I look at uh, assists, turnovers, uh, offensive rebounding, rebounding, and free throws because in my Subjective world, this is a sign of how aggressive was the team. I don't look at three pointers, two pointers, who played how much and uh, how many points the players did. I look maybe later. This is not uh, very relevant for, because if a team has more offensive rebounding, that means that you know we were aggressive. Uh, if we uh, now, depending on, uh, for instance, in Andrea's style of basketball, there'd be a slow, slow uh, pace. If you have over 10 turnovers, then you know you, you can't win a game. But if you are if you speed up and you have a couple of more turnovers, it doesn't mean really that uh, that you are not in the game. So th these are the aspects that uh, that I'm looking uh, that I'm looking at. Obviously, in this game against Panathinaikos, you know I think that 12. If I'm pretty sure, I, I, if I'm not mistaken, that 12 free throws more than us. And, uh, yes. you know, so this is 10 in, 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 in a game with not too many points. This is a lot, you know, yes. 10 points mm -hmm. more to free throws. And then I don't know if this column, if you have it for sure somewhere, also how many fast break points you had, how many easy points that you received. This is a st statistic that we do internally, uh, Benas. Mm -hmm. Our assistant coach on the bench does it. How many fast break points or how mm -hmm. many easy baskets, let's define it, easy baskets did we have? But this game was very specific because we started the game very, very slowly. We, we were down 10-0. And then when you start the game slowly in the halftime, you look uh, at the second half, how many points did you receive in the second half? I believe in this game we had 27 in the first quarter. 
Uh, and now I don't know. Yeah, I'm, but I tell you, I, I can yeah. tell you. I think we had twenty-seven in the first quarter, but eleven points in the in the second quarter. You know, so this also shows that we got somehow in the rhythm. So this is the 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 the, the, the columns that I look at um, uh, in the game. Yeah. Okay. So I mean, that's that's a. Uh... The, the, you know the box scores at halftime are very much telling also of how the game is it's, it's, it's going into it. I say like the the also the fouls you draw, the the fast break Correct. points you receive, that smart fouls, no smart fouls. So all those things, Correct. All, all those things, um, especially during the game, are more relevant than than after the game. After the game, you look at sometimes you look at other things. Correct, I agree. So for everybody, everybody who's interested in, in, in watching and looking at statistics from all around the world, uh, please go to proballers.com. And uh, Marco, thank you for this quick, quick analysis. You're welcome. Um, so now we move, we move on to the, to the uh, fun part, the, the, the private part. That's a little bit, little bit um, like we, we talked a lot about, you know, the professional part. And I always say to my guests, may the, may the achievements rest in peace, all the titles rest in peace. We're all humans talking. At the end of the day, we are sharing our human experience combined with our professional experience. And hopefully the human experience also impacts our professional experience. Uh, and I'm wondering of what the information diet is for you. In terms of information diet, I mean, what information you observe outside of, of basketball that also can impact your your professional life, but it's also important for you in a daily life. Because I told, I just was just at this university. I was talking to up and coming young coaches that they should read and imp or listen to podcasts that are not involved with basketball, but other other spheres, whether it's science, whether it's uh, uh, other 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 areas that are self improvement in many sense in, in in how to think, how to how to structure your thinking. Thought, think, thought patterns, you know, what are they based on? So I'm wondering what, if what impacts your thinking on a daily basis and where you get your information from. Uh, this, this is a, this is a very, uh, you know, before, bef before we did uh, this podcast, you sent me a couple of notes. And one of those notes was, uh, uh, where did you get, where, where do you get your, um, Basically, where do you where do you get your knowledge from? Well, how how yes, do you yes. right? And this is a very good question today's uh, in, in today in today's life, especially in mine, because um, everything all the information all the information that you digest are very fast. Mm -hmm. You know, I talk to you on the phone, Ben. Asks, what do you think about this player? Then I call somebody else. Then you know, somebody calls. So everything is very fast, and there there is something that I personally understood that I have to take my time is uh, to read more you know now I do a lot of podcasts to be honest I'm a huge YouTube and uh, and podcast guy because every time I work out it's either YouTube or podcast and I try to uh, what I try to I try to uh, listen to um, to people that are not in basketball I like to listen to experiences from people from different sports. Is it uh, American football? Is it rugby? Is it soccer? Is it volleyball or whatever? But also I would like, you know, I listen to, to uh, uh, you know, uh, the information that you get out of the media, you know, it is, it, it, there is a variety of things and you have to make sure that you listen to the people that, that give you information fast, uh, understandable, and and uh, relatively true, and this is a challenge you uh, that, that that I that I always uh, have. But uh, what what I what what I you know I'm I'm speaking. I try to speak three languages good. You know, let's say formerly Serbo Croatian, Yugoslavian, German, and English. So what I do constantly, I, I read books in different languages. So one book is in let's say Serbic, Serbo Croatian, the other one is English, the third is in German. And those books uh, are re relatively uh, not connected to 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 sports at all. Maybe to uh, psychology, maybe to management. Uh, sometimes uh, just uh, novels or whatever it is. But I try to keep up with learning language uh, languages. Uh, this is what I do. Uh, but I. I have to think more thoroughly about this question and uh, because it's an excellent question. I can't give you a definitive uh, opinion on this. 
No, but this is this is very important because I have I have a similar experience in terms of using a language, and I knew once I learned Russian when I went to Russia, it yeah. it it changed the way I thought because it opened up a different no. it, different dynamic in my in my brain, and the, the 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 thought patterns were completely different because you saw you learned a different way of thinking. Not only oh, reading Cyr- Cyrillic, you read also Cyrillic because yeah, I do. I do. So, yeah. so it also yeah. changes the way, and it's hard scientifically for me to explain it, but I know it impacts my my world worldview. No, listen, the, the uh, you know it's obvious that there's absolutely no discussion about this that that uh, a American uh, approaches a problem differently than a German and totally different than a Serbian guy, uh, no matter what the problem is. So. If, if you get into, into reading to refresh the language, automatically when you read the book, uh, I don't know, let's say from, from, from an American writer, he might or even be a sports writer. And then there is a problem that he approaches about uh, psychology in sports. And then you read a Serbian book about this, the approach to the problem is totally different. And the analysis of how this problem happened is totally different. So by refreshing the language, Okay, this is something that uh, uh, you know you have to do, obviously. But the culture, the culture of the things, how those people in those three different countries, let's say, approach things, is totally different, and you automatically learn something. You know, to understand at least how American player might think or a Serbian player might think. So this is something that I do. But you know, our life is so fast that you basically, if I'm if I'm on a treadmill and I'm running and I'm listening to your podcast um that's it and then you move on and then you know it is very difficult i must say and this is a very good question i really really need to think, think thoroughly to organize myself better in that sense i think i think there is because there is a, a, i when i start learning about podcasts from tim ferris from chris williamson who's modern wisdom i start learning different perspectives joe rogan has so many variety of guests on that i learn from i'm not listening to every podcast episode because sometimes no. it just veers off into into some like mma i'm not listening to because it just doesn't it doesn't yeah. touch me but That's there's certain cer- certain things that it helps me to build my value system and my perspective right. and you you have you you're building a a you're evolving as a human being and you start to make decisions in a different way because you start to look at things are different you start you start absorb information from people a different way because you learn to to think that okay he's just thinking in a different way than i am thinking and you start develop certain sort of empathy uh, indirectly because of the information that you consumed in the past no i agree but uh, one point is really really key what you just said so if if i have a negotiations with you or i am talking to you there is a discussion it's very important for me to also Put myself in your perspective to understand yeah. how you're thinking. Where, where do you come from? Why do you think like this? Uh, what is your end goal? Just just to be, not to support your idea, but to be better prepared. What might come from you towards me in the sense of uh, of uh, understanding of the person? And uh, this is uh, the way you are explaining now is i mean it's it is totally true if i listen to a podcast of whoever and then there is a guy who i totally uh oppose his opinion uh, whatever uh, is it politics it is is it sports is it uh, finance or whatever still it does not mean that you can pick his brain on something different which is not his opinion but the approach to uh you know i'm very interested how do people approach things you know and uh, although you you totally disagree with his uh, with his view or his vision, what you can learn is how he approaches the topic. And uh, I totally agree with you. I yeah, and that's that. I, I talked to a lot of people about the spectrum of people. The more people you you meet in your lifetime, in your in, yes. in lifespan, from different cultures with different languages, different cultures, different backgrounds, the more you learn a big a wider spectrum of of perspectives. And it's the same thing with information. You know, the more wider spectrum of information you absorb from different areas, the more wider values, the more wider, wider information you can also share and understand different oh, yeah. different side of things. Yeah. Are there are there habits that influence you? Maybe that you picked up through through information that you absorb that you that you that influence you on a daily basis that you do? I I, I actually do. I listen. Uh, I don't know if you know this guy, uh, Huberman. 
Yeah, yeah. You know him? Yeah. And um, uh, his podcasts are way too long, right? They are two, yeah, yeah, two yeah. and a half Very hours scientific, and, very scientific. Yeah, very, very scientific, very scientific. But there is uh, there are a couple of things that I picked up that I... Uh, that I, uh, you know, really used, uh, I'll try to use daily. It's not always possible because of the traveling and stuff, but, um, uh, you, you know, when you wake up, when I wake up now in the morning, the first thing I do is I go I go out, no matter if the sun or not sun, <laughs> and, and I, probably I look like a total idiot. Uh, I go get my coffee, and then for 20 minutes, I'm taking a walk, and I'm looking uh, uh, to the sky. <laughs> <laughs> and most probably, okay, I'm, I'm, I, uh, I get up really early. There are not, not many people seeing me. But, you know, I, probably from outside, I look like a total, total idiot. But I must tell you one thing. It helps me. You know, it helps me. Uh, you know, it look uh, when when you listen to him the first time, uh, you think, yeah, whatever. You know, you look in the sky. Why? Why the hell you? Okay, when there is a sun, you look in. Okay, he put the shades on. You look. Yeah. But you know, it has something. You know, it it adds something to you. Uh, it 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 helps you through the day. You know, it helps you sleep better, which is yes. may, maybe it's a placebo. I don't know. <laughs> Pro probably it's it. a placebo. Little little bit is always for placebo. Sure. Yeah. No, no, for, for sure. But uh, you know, this is one example uh, that I really do. I I, uh, uh, I learned discipline. I learned a little bit discipline through him. Uh, you know, when you wake up, take a walk, sit down, write the time when you wake up uh, in the morning, write some things that you want to do in the day or the night before, and so on and so on. So I do pick up. I do pick up things um, uh, which I which I try or want to try, maybe don't believe, but let's try on them. And this human guy is very, very, you know, very interesting to listen to him. I don't agree on everything he says, obviously, but there are some kind of things I say, okay, this I will try. Yeah, yeah. Uh, Alex Friedman is also a good one. Um, Lex, sorry, Lex, Lex, Lex Friedman. Sorry, Lex, Lex Friedman. Friedman. Yeah, I Lex Friedman. Too, yeah. So yeah, yeah jour journaling is important. I, I wish I could do more of journaling just to just because when you write, you you have a better thought pattern later on when you can Le it, it put your thoughts listen, on paper. Listen, I learned this from my father. My father was always writing. I, I believe, and uh, if you go to him and you ask him, listen, in uh, 1991. Uh, on this day, what was your practice? He will he will get his book out and he will he will show you. Yanis Ropos okay. is the same. Yanis will do the same. Yeah. So, so I have this from him. I really, if you get into my closet here, you know, you will <laughs> see. I, I really do write a lot. You know, I tried something on my iPad, okay, uh, yeah. to go digital, but um, it's different. It's different. Yeah, yeah. it uh, doesn't help your thinking process. So I really, I, I really do write a lot. So quick. Quickly on the on the biohacking part with the sunlight, there was another guy that was also I listened to was Ben Greenfield, but he was so crazy. I got the information I needed out of him, and I I, I said, <laughs> I okay, this, this is enough. This I, I dropped. I'm I'm moving yeah. on to the next thing because he was with the vitamin D. He was going overboard, in my perspective. I mean, he was trying to be optimized up to optimize everything, every part of his life to the to the to the to the max. Yeah, but that's and and you yeah, can't. It's not sustainable on a daily basis. It's not sustainable. So you know, yeah. fasting. You you miss out on all the social events because you're trying to fast in the evening. Or yeah. uh, he was getting the vitamin D. He was going out because the best way to absorb vitamin D is through your ass. So you goes out naked. And, <laughs> yeah. So next next level yeah, next level crazy. biohacking. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Um, before before I go into the ATOs to finish up our podcast uh, quickly, do you? The family balance is the 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 key in our in our uh, in our life that feel like you always do not enough for one or the other. Do you feel like you're optimized that part of your life? Uh, if you get in details, for sure not, one hundred percent not. I mean, uh, but I, you know, I was born into a sports family, basically. I and I don't know anything else, right? So I don't have. I. I. I you know. I, the lifestyle is the lifestyle. Okay, so now I'm very, very lucky to have a wife who is with me from my early days as a player. So she got also she got used to it. Now we have a son who is 18 who also is playing basketball. So basically, 
everything is invo involved uh, around um, around uh, my job in basketball. So, but I'm lucky, I must say, uh, I'm very lucky with, uh, uh, that my that my wife understands that. Otherwise, it would be very difficult. But it is not perfect, I must say. But that support is important for you to be successful no, at your it's job. Key. It's key. key. No, yeah. key. Key. Uh, I mean, there, there is absolutely no question about it. Okay. She learned. My wife learned a lot uh, uh, from my mother. I must tell you. She <laughs> she, 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 ex, she explained it. All, my my mother explained it a lot. Uh, <laughs> she, she was in even worse situation than, than my wife was. Oh, I, I mean, this is a whole other podcast, probably. Ah, <laughs> yeah. So, are you ready for the ATOs that I prepare? I'm yes, gonna hit you right, quick. Sir. I'm gonna hit you yeah. quick, and uh, you whatever pops into your head, you you answer. When do you know you're pushing too hard? Yourself, pushing yourself too hard. When I can't sleep. One do and one don't in your job. Don't give up. That's, that's a don't. Ne never, never give up. And a do is give your best. After your playing career, if there was no path to stay in basketball, what would have been your path? I would have studied, uh, I don't know now the English word, to become a lawyer. Mm -hmm. how, how you, it's in German, it's Jura. I don't know how you call it. Law, right? Law, I, law, I, yeah. I, I, yeah. Would, I would have studied law, for sure. Mm -hmm. uh, biggest pet peeve in regards to the team? Biggest what? Pet peeve. Uh, it's something that annoys you. I find, like my biggest pet peeve when I go to a ca cafe is probably a table that's wobbly. I can't. Okay. I can't sit at a wobbly table. Okay. So uh, something that gives you anxiety. Ego egoism. Egoism. Uh, biggest question to ask during the season in regards to your team. One question. One biggest question. If you can put one above all. I mean, short question or what, 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 what do you mean? Just not general, make a mistake. Ge to general are we aligned? Are, are we aligned? Yeah. Okay, good. Are we aligned? Biggest question to ask yourself in the off season? After the season or before the season? <laughs> before the season. Oh, no, let's just say after the season. Because you reflect. You reflect and then after the season. Okay. Uh... Did I make the same mistakes I did? Uh, did, did I repeat my mistakes? Hmm. And the biggest, uh, my favorite Tim Ferriss question that, that I'm sure you've heard before, your favorite failure that you learned the biggest lessons from, it's a failure, but nevertheless, it's something that you cherish and you feel like that taught you, taught you something you, you are holding on, to, holding on to to this day. I cannot answer this question by very, uh, very crispy and fast. Okay. Because I because I believe when you when you lose a game and you lose a championship, uh, I, I don't see this as a failure. It might it might look stupid. I think, um, you know, and and in my personal, I I cannot uh, I I I can't come up with the right question if. Not winning a championship is a failure. Then it is okay. Then this is the answer to your question. But not winning a championship or losing a game is not. I don't define this as a failure. No, I, I would you agree know, with so, that. So, yeah. so uh, you know, maybe overall, uh, uh, overall, if you want to ask me a failure that I didn't listen enough when, and when I was younger, I, I don't, I, I don't, I, I don't mean just my father. You know, I. I I was too rebelish, you know, and yeah. uh, I should have listened more. Uh, I think this is something that I'm trying to change now. That I really try to listen to people who are around me. I'm, I'm a very, I was a very bad listener. I'm trying to improve in this. I think this is something that I, uh, I need to be get much better uh, in to listen. You know, just don't talk. Listen, man. Listen to the guy next to you. And I should have listened more in my in my uh, past. And this is something that uh, that is a failure. Let's say that I'm trying to correct. Yeah, that's great, Marco. This has been 
this has been a a, a dinner basically it was something that this <laughs> this conversation this conversation yeah. was dinner worthy let's call it <laughs> i appreciate for you sure. coming on for sure. I, for sure. i like to go into details and i know you your details uh, are very man. valuable yeah man, uh, you're welcome in munich we go for a good red wine because in berlin you don't have good red wines man. <laughs> Lithuania, but, <laughs> <laughs> but it has, has to be after October because I'm still sober in October. Yeah, good. I uh, good luck with that, and I uh, wish you all the best. Thank I you, plan, and great for having me. I will plan. I will plan to come in November, and then maybe uh, also watch a soccer game because I've never been Perfect. to the state. I've never been to the stadium, so you're I, welcome. I, I, you're I'll, I'll let that. you know. All right, man. All right. Penas, all the best. Bye -bye. Thank you very much. Thank you. Bye-bye, everyone. Bye-bye.